Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Governor Wolf's first ever Facebook town hall. Yesterday, we asked you to submit <coughs> questions for the governor, and so today he's here with us live answering your questions on Facebook. Governor, welcome. Thank you, Megan. It's good to be here. Yes. Well, let's get started. We're going to talk about a topic um, that a lot of people have been talking about, and that's property taxes. Right. Ed from Quakertown has our first question. Why not eliminate property taxes? What changes would you like to see to House Bill, Senate Bill 76? in order to sign it into law. Of course, that's the Property Tax Independence Act. So why not eliminate property taxes? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm trying to, to reduce property taxes dramatically. I heard throughout the campaign that <clears throat> people want uh, property tax relief. But I also heard that, that people want to invest in education, that we need to have schools that, that can actually teach and that where teachers and educators have the resources they need to, to teach. So House Bill 76, Senate Bill 76, while it uh, does a nice job in, in uh, reducing the property taxes dramatically. Uh, it, it doesn't make, I think, the, the investment in the public goods and in education specifically that I think we need to, to make. So I've tried to do this in a way that creates $3.8 billion of tax relief, property tax relief, uh, in a way that we can afford uh, and in a way that still allows us to make the investments we need to make in a great future. And if your plan passes and reduces school taxes, as you'd like to see, what measures are there to then prevent these districts from raising property taxes once again? Yeah, what you don't want to have happen is that we, we do all this work to reduce the taxes and then uh, local school boards uh, down the road uh, increase the, the, the tax. Uh, what I've done and what I'm proposing in my budget is to take the reserve, which right now uh, if your reserves uh, are between, it depends on the school district, between 8 and 12 percent of your annual budget, uh, if it's below that, uh, then you can raise property taxes without a referendum. Uh, in my budget, I propose reducing that cap from 8 to 12 percent down to 4 percent. Uh, and that would keep uh, the overwhelming, most, almost all the school districts in Pennsylvania from, from being able to raise property taxes unless there's a, a referendum and, and the assent of the voters to, to do that. Uh, we have to make sure, and my goal is to make sure that this is dollar for dollar property tax reduction, that that $3.8 billion uh, in, in property tax reduction that I want to see actually goes to property tax reduction, and, and that's, that's important. So uh, this is my plan, my proposal for doing that. Uh, I'm obviously open to any suggestions as to how we can improve that. Uh, I, I want to make sure that's dollar for dollar property tax relief. All right, and into our next big talking point <coughs> regarding your budget is public education. Um, Lisa from State College tells a story about her son who attended cyber school and asks, what are your plans for cyber charter schools? Well, my plans are, are to, to try to make it, apparently she was very happy with the education her son received there, and I want to make sure that, that all cyber charter schools uh, are held to the, the appropriate accountability so that they provide their students with as good an education. Uh, so uh, I want accountability in our charter school program, including bricks and mortar, but also cyber charter schools. Uh, and I also want to make sure that the taxpayers uh, are paying an appropriate amount. I think uh, we, we need to make sure that we're not overpaying. So uh, I propose, since we have uh, intermediate units, public education, uh, many of our intermediate units are already providing public option on cyber education, uh, that, and using the same software, that, that, that actually we know what that costs, uh, and I'm proposing to reimburse cyber, private cyber charter schools that amount plus 10 percent as a, as a cushion, uh, that should save us $160 million. So what I'm proposing again is accountability to make sure that every child gets a good education in a cyber charter school um, and also proposing uh, a formula for reimbursement that should uh, protect the taxpayer from, from uh, paying too much. Roger from McClure, and this is a direct quote, upon moving back to Pennsylvania two years ago, I noticed a serious lack in my local school district with no marching bands and no instrumental instruction. My question is, will some of your education funding go to improve the music fine arts programs within our schools? Well, first of all, welcome back to Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, but yes, the, uh, the, the idea of, of a good basic education system is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, but also the arts. 
uh, and, and a good education has to in include that. Uh, and and uh, part of the reason that schools, some schools have eliminated those programs is because they don't have the funds. My investment in education uh, is premised on the idea that, that all students in Pennsylvania will get a good education, a full education. Uh, they won't be robbed of, of some of the elements of, of that educational program, including music and art. Uh, and so um, while I focus a lot on the reduction of property taxes, I've also focused a lot uh, on the investment side. We need to invest more in public education. I've proposed in my budget to do that, and one of the goals is to make sure that every student has access to the programs that he correctly identified as, as uh, unfortunately being eliminated from too many schools. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to higher education. C. Elam from Belfont says, how does your administration plan to expand financial support for Commonwealth public and state related higher education? Well, in my budget, I simply propose um, giving money restoring the cuts that the prior administration had made to higher education. Now I'm doing that over a two year process, two, two year cycle so that over the next, this year and next year, 100% of that those cuts will be restored, uh, and, and that's still uh, my goal, so that 50% uh, of that restoration is in this budget, and the second 50% will be in, in the next, uh, I hope, in the next budget. Okay, let's shift gears. Medical marijuana, big talking point these days. <clears throat> Teresa from Lackawanna County, what is your stance on legalizing it? Well, as I said throughout the campaign, I'm for legalization of medical marijuana, uh, and I'm working with uh, two senators, one Republican, one Democrat right now to uh, uh, support them in their efforts to bring a uh, legalized medical marijuana bill uh, into being. Um, so I have uh, uh, strongly supported that. I think doctors really ought to be in charge of prescribing medication they think their patients need most. Uh, and uh, so uh, we give doctors the, the, the ability to prescribe uh, much stronger uh, drugs than that, and, and, and I think uh, we should do no less in this case, give them the ability to, to prescribe the medication they think will best help their patients. Okay. Sales tax. Linda from Dallas Town and the Republican Party of Pennsylvania want to know more about the sales tax component of your budget plan. So can you explain why you're changing the sales tax at all in Pennsylvania, and then how does that relate to property taxes? Well, I'm trying to, to uh, create, we're addressing a number of deficits. I think we have an education deficit. We're not investing as much as we should. But we also have a structural budget deficit. Just in general, we're, we're looking to consume more public goods than we're willing to pay for. And that's the structural budget deficit. That means no matter how much your economy grows, uh, revenues just aren't going to keep up with what you need. So we have to bridge that, that gap. Uh, I'm trying to do a number of things at, at once here, invest in education, reduce property taxes, reduce the corporate and income tax. And one way we can, can do that is to uh, change the personal income tax and the sales tax, which I'm proposing to, uh, to do. Uh, my uh, proposal on the sales tax calls for raising the rate by six-tenths of one percent, from six to six-point-six percent. And to keep that as modest as that by broadening the base, by making sure we're, in, in many ways, bringing the, the sales tax from the 1950s, which is when it was first established, to the 21st century, where a lot of new products and services are being sold and consumed that weren't in the 1950s. The economy is different now, uh, and I think that tax should be brought up to speed. If we broaden the base, it, it means a, a much more moderate increase is necessary to fund the things we need to fund. Okay. And and having to do with property taxes at the same time. Well, and, and as I said, that, that allows us to, to uh, uh, produce the huge reduction in property taxes that, that uh, uh, I'm, I'm calling for a 50% on average reduction in, in uh, property taxes for funding public education. Uh, I think uh, uh, we're allowed, I'm, I'm going to be allowed to do that with this modest increase in the sales tax. Talk about your budget. Denise from Bucks County, how will you build a strong collaborative relationship with legislators that will then enable you to move your agenda forward? Well, that's, that's an important point. I'm a new governor, uh, so I haven't been through the budget process before, but I understand that, that I need to, to build consensus. And I'm basing my goal here of, of, of building consensus and, and the, the means to that end uh, on the idea that, that 
um, the legislators, Republican and Democrat, heard the same thing I did from the voters of Pennsylvania. They want property tax relief. My budget has that in a big way. Uh, and I'm assuming that, that, that they'll agree with me that that's important. Uh, I heard from my constituents, as I'm sure they heard from theirs, that we need to invest in education. Uh, I've heard from many people over the years that we need to reduce the corporate income tax. All these things are in my budget. Uh, and so the, the, the fundamental area of agreement, I think, uh, is that we all want those same things. And, and so we can start from that point, and there'll be areas of disagreement. But I'm hoping that, that I can build support simply by the elements that I've put into this budget. Healthcare. Art from Erie wants to know, is your new Medicaid expansion plan really an expansion and when does it take effect? It really is an expansion uh, and, and the idea is, is to do what we've done before. We've, we've had Medicaid since the 1960s, I think, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so we, we're familiar with it. The people who uh, are Medicaid clients uh, understand, understand it. Uh, and what we're talking about here is simply expanding that and extending that to an extra 600,000 Pennsylvanians. Um, it's not creating a new bureaucracy. It's not creating new layers of service. It's just doing what we've always done. Uh, the goal is to have uh, the first phase of that in place um, by early June uh, and the, the f fully implemented by uh, the early fall, late September, early October. Uh, the goal is to have a clearly understood, clearly defined system uh, that is as efficient as possible for the taxpayers of Pennsylvania, but is also something that, that uh, the clients uh, can, can use. Okay. On to the gas drilling and energy industry. Annette would like to know, I'd like to know if you have any plans for moving our state forward with renewable energy and starting to move away from fracking. Well, I think my, I, I want to impose a severance tax, uh, and, and I want to do that because I think the uh, industry, the gas industry, could be not only a source of revenue for the state, for education, for example, uh, but a source of new jobs. But I also see the, the severance tax uh, as, the, uh, as a place that we can raise money for building a bridge to a sustainable energy future. Uh, we used to have a, a pretty robust system of tax incentives, of grants uh, that would allow people encourage people to put photovoltaic cells on their house, to build and, and uh, uh, use wind farms to generate electricity. We need to do more of that kind of thing. So in my budget, I have a $675 million bond issue that would be serviced from that severance tax, about 50 to $60 million a year that would provide the funding to build that bridge that she's talking about. And Linda would like to know, will <coughs> counties still receive funds from gas companies if the new tax is enacted? That's a really important point. The uh, severance tax replaces the impact fee, but embedded in my severance tax is a proposal to make sure that, that localities where drilling takes place and that are heavily affected by it uh, continue to get uh, the fees they got before. So I've actually targeted uh, the impact fee amount at $225 million, which is I think the high point that was reached in the impact fee, which is two or so years ago, uh, to make sure that, that they are guaranteed that $225 million uh, moving forward in my severance. But that's the first cut in my severance tax. Okay. Minimum wage. Chanel from Philadelphia wants okay. to know where you stand on raising the minimum wage. She says it's been long overdue and will tremendously help those working an hourly wage and putting themselves through school like me. Yeah, it, it, it will help individual workers, but you know, it's, it's also going to be a, a good thing for the economy. There are a lot of uh, ideas out there about the, the, the minimum wage. Right now it's at $7.25. I'm proposing to raise it to $10.10 .10 an hour. Uh, right now, somebody making uh, the minimum wage uh, and working full-time makes about $15,000 a year. If you have two children, you can't live on that. That's, that's, that's below the poverty level. I don't think, as I said in my budget address, that someone working full-time in Pennsylvania should be living in poverty. Um, so I, I think from her point of view and from the point of view of people making the minimum wage, this, this is a, a big deal. And over 80% of people making minimum wage are adults, people over 20 years of age. So this is, this is a big deal. But it's also going to help the economy. Um, in my business, when I went back to turn it around, it was flat on its back. And one of the first things 
early things I did was to raise uh, the rates for hourly workers um, dramatically. Uh, my own minimum wage uh, increase from what I thought were pretty good wages before to even better. Uh, and not only did it not cost me jobs, it actually increased my productivity and increased the, the number of jobs and, and improved my company. I mean, we, we've, we've done quite well, turned it around. And I, and I think part of it is that. So there's a lot of theory to suggest that actually increasing the minimum wage uh, increases aggregate demand. It, it does a lot of things to make our economy more efficient and better, and that's why I, I, I support it. I support it because it's going to help families. It's going to help our economy. Okay. Let's switch gears one last time to a topic we've been hearing a lot about in the news <coughs> this week uh, out of Indiana. Kevin would like to know, Governor Wolf, in light of what has been going on in Indiana, will you finally be the governor who pushes for equal protection in employment, housing, etc., based on sexual orientation and gender identity? Uh, I have been pushing that throughout my campaign, and I think, uh, yes, I, I, and I've continued to push for that since I've been inaugurated as governor. Uh, so yes, that's, that's absolutely essential. Uh, and as I pointed out throughout the campaign, it's not just because it's the right thing to do. It is. Uh, uh, but it's because it's smart. Uh, in my business, um, I was inclusive, and I practiced diversity. Uh, because I wanted to make sure that I was looking at, at a talent pool that was as broad as it could possibly be. I was getting access to the best talent out there. And, and I think that's what we need to do. And it's also something that we need to think about as Pennsylvanians. This Commonwealth was founded by William Penn on the basis of freedom, uh, uh, tolerance for religion, freedom of conscience. Uh, he came to Pennsylvania on the ship called the Welcome. And I think we need to make sure that, that Pennsylvania continues uh, to be welcome and open to everybody regardless of, of, of who they are, uh, who they love, uh, religion they profess. And, and I think um, um, we all need to, to look at, at inclusion as something that's not just right, but something that's also smart. Okay. Well, that's gonna do it for us. I, just, I guess I had one last question about social media in general. Uh, since you were sworn in as governor, <coughs> you've done a Twitter town hall and now this Facebook town hall. How's it been going and why do you think it's so important to interact with Pennsylvanians in this way? Well, I think in, in a democracy, you, you should look for any possible way you can interact with, with the, the people who hired you. Uh, the voters of Pennsylvania voted for me, for governor, and, and I need to continue the conversation that, that I think I engaged in in the, in the campaign. And social media has been a great way to do that. I mean, just one way television or, or letters uh, don't do it, but I've had a Twitter town hall, now th this. Uh, and I'm 66 years old, so this is, this is new for me, but, but it's something that I think is, is really important, and, I, and I'll keep looking for new ways uh, to, to reach out to make sure that, that I'm communicating and listening and hearing uh, what I should hear from the, the people who I serve. Governor, thank you. Thank you so much for watching, and feel free to weigh in on today's live stream Facebook Town Hall on Governor Wolf's Facebook page.